Hello and welcome everyone. We are going to take a minute to let people join the webinar and then we will get started. Hello and welcome to the Myositis Association's Empowerment Clinic webinar series. My name is Rachel Bromley and I will be your host today. I am TMA's Senior Manager of Patient Education Support and Advocacy. TMA's Empowerment Clinics are designed to enhance the quality of life for those living with myositis and their care partners. Today's topic is the why and how of legislative advocacy. By advocating in the legislature, patients can contribute to shaping policies that affect their access to healthcare, insurance coverage, and the overall quality of healthcare services. Involvement in legislative advocacy empowers patients to actively participate in decisions that impact their well being. It can foster a sense of agency and contribute to a more patient centered healthcare system. With Rare Disease Week later this month, TMA reached out to Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases to share with our members why and how to get involved. We are so pleased to have a, with us today Shannon Von Felden and she is the Senior Director of Advocacy at Every Light, as well as Rare Disease Legislative Advocate James Griffith. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, Shannon, let's start with you. Please tell us more about your organization and why it exists. Perfect. Thank you. I'd love to. And thank you so much to TMA and to Rachel for having me. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk about one of my favorite subjects, advocacy. I've been involved in uh, policy and advocacy for over 20 years now. And here in Washington, D.C., I started my career on Capitol Hill as one of those staffers that you meet when you go to meet with your members of Congress and, and switch to the other side and now get to help rare disease patients and caregivers and family members uh, advocate for themselves and their family members. Uh, I am with the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization located here in Washington, DC, and we're dedicated to empowering the rare disease patient community to advocate for legislation and policy changes that will advance the equitable development of life-saving diagnoses, treatments, and cures. And Rare Disease Legislative Advocates is our advocacy program um, here at the Every Life Foundation. So our main goal um, as part of Rare Disease Legislative Advocates is to educate patient advocates about how legislation and policy impact their lives and the availability and access of treatments and provide them with the resources, training, and opportunities to be effective advocates. And so part of that is building awareness on Capitol Hill and ensuring that Congress hears directly from rare disease patients and caregivers and other stakeholders before they make change that will impact um, rare disease patients' lives. So some of the things that um, we do is provide resources, opportunities, trainings, and really simply a first step to advocacy can just be signing up for our monthly newsletter and seeing what's available on our website at rareadvocates.org. Uh, this is a visual of the state of rare diseases, where we are as a community, and the reasons why many of us advocate on behalf of the rare disease community. Um, this exemplifies the community as a whole. Um, there are over 10,000 rare diseases. There are 30 million people who are estimated to be affected. Um, it takes up to 15 years on average for a drug to be developed and approved by the FDA, which is much longer than some of us can wait. And um, Every Life Foundation conducted a study on the economic burden of rare diseases back in 2019 and found that a subset of just over 300 rare diseases cost uh, the individual patients and their families 
as well as the healthcare system, $1 trillion in that one year. Uh, so rare diseases is a costly public health problem. Um, and then out of that economic burden of rare diseases study, um, we really saw that uh, rare disease patients um, were facing a long diagnostic odyssey. We knew that, we just didn't have the numbers to, um, to show what that diagnostic odyssey really looked like for patients. So that economic burden for a disease study, um, we came out with numbers um, that the average uh, number of years that a patient navigated without a rare disease diagnosis was on average 6.3 years. And that in that time, uh, they saw on average 16.9 specialists. So not only was the diagnostic odyssey costing patients and families extensive time, but it was also delaying appropriate care and treatments and causing irreversible disease progression and complications. Um, in addition, it was also um, making an impact and a cost to um, the patients, their families, uh, and the healthcare system. So uh, the Everlay Foundation set off for a second follow-up study to really measure that impact of the delayed diagnosis in rare diseases. Um, that study came out just last year and showed that uh, the cost of that delayed diagnosis across seven rare diseases um, the economic impact of the medical costs and the loss in income for the individuals and families cost on average the um, two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, or <clears throat> eighty six thousand through five hundred seventeen thousand per patient. Uh, so these are just a few reasons why many of us choose to uh, advocate on behalf of the rare disease community. And I know that advocacy sounds like a really big word um, and it seems maybe a lot more mysterious than it actually is. But advocacy is really a person or a group of people who want to influence or make change. And so that can certainly be any of us here today. I went one too far, all right. And some examples of advocacy um, the advocacy takes a lot of forms. Um, you might have heard of patient advocacy, which could be uh, advocating on behalf of yourself or your loved one in the doctor's office or in the healthcare system. Um, advocacy takes on a lot of forms. So today I'm really talking about that legislative advocacy. So, so some examples of the, that legislative advocacy that we're talking about is contacting your lawmakers when you disagree or support something and you wanna bring an issue to their attention, attending events that your elected officials will be at, like a town hall, creating a petition, attending a march or a protest, uh, sending a postcard, letter, or email to your lawmaker and making them as personalized as possible. And of course, meeting with your members of Congress, your legislators. go. And then this study is getting a little bit dated. It's from 2015 from the Congressional Management Foundation. And they actually asked members of Congress and staffers the impact of certain contacts from their constituents and the amount of influence that they had on the decisions that they were making. And so you can see at the top that those in-person visits from constituents uh, had the most impact on those decisions that those offices were making. Uh, the the letters, the emails, the phone calls, those still have significant value as well in influencing members of Congress. Those in-person visits though uh, are still at the top. And I like to use this not so much to tell you how a bill gets passed. Uh, we probably have seen um, the, um, the video, the cartoon from our, from at least my child many times of how a bill becomes a law. But what I like about this visual is that it really shows all the different points at which you as an advocate can make an impact. So from the time a bill gets introduced, there are so many points through the process where your input can be extremely helpful um, 
to um, make changes to a bill, to make amendments, to, um, to make sure that your voice is heard. And of course, you never want to wait until it's too late, especially knowing that the process is long and that there are several points at which your input is important. Um, and part of what we do is really trying to help our advocates create those relationships because creating the relationships with your members of Congress, your state legislators, with their staff is really integral to having that influence, to be able to make that change that you might be looking for. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's really a build up. You're really building these relationships. It takes time to pass laws and building the relationships takes a, can take a long time too, um, but certainly uh, is the most effective way to uh, go about it. Uh, and as I said before, um, anytime and all the time is really the, the perfect time to advocate. Um, there are so many different opportunities. You don't have to come to Washington, D.C. to advocate. You can make a phone call. You can email your representative and your senators. Um, and when you personalize those emails um, and those phone calls. You're, um, the, the offices, I must say, are getting a lot more savvy and uh, understanding what those form emails are. And so when you can personalize, when you can send an individual email or make a phone call, uh, for some offices, those will make a larger impact. Um, we hear that from staffers. Um, uh, from time to time of how they treat different communications that are coming into their offices differently. Um, but you don't have to come into Washington, D.C. to meet with your representative or centers. They have district or in-state offices where they go um, back home because technically <laughs> they do live in their home states and their districts. Um, and they have work periods where they attend events or they take meetings in their district or state office. And those are really wonderful times to meet with your members, to meet with your legislators. They have more time, they're much more relaxed. Um, and I really encourage if you haven't done that, uh, I'll talk in a few minutes about a program we have here at the Every Life Foundation to help with that. But um, those are really uh, lovely opportunities. Of course, don't wait until it's too late. Um, you don't want to wait until something has been done um, because uh, it's 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 much harder to undo um, if if there are some critical errors or um, consequences of legislation that maybe wasn't thought through without your input. So um, you want to be vocal early um, throughout the process about those issues that you care about. And at, on our website, we have lots of different resources and tools. We have policy primers that can walk you through different policy issues that are timely um, for you to better understand what those issues are. Um, we have legislative scorecards by state that we're actually updating right now before Rare Disease Week for the 118th Congress um, to give you kind of a snapshot of how your members in your state um, stand on certain rare disease policy issues that they faced um, recently. Um, and it's a snapshot, it certainly doesn't cover everything, the scorecards that they could possibly have done to support uh, the rare disease community. But it's certainly a, a nice little talking point when you do talk to them to go over what um, they've supported and what they haven't supported already. And we have tip sheets for anyone um, to get started in advocacy. Uh, these are some examples here. We have a tip sheet on advocacy in the congressional appropriations process for you to better understand um, the appropriations process and how uh, funding um, and funding for certain programs and making appropriations requests work, um, how to schedule a meeting with your legislator and fostering a relationship with your members of Congress. And I wanted to include one success story for you all. Um, there are many. And what I liked about this example was it shows a rare disease community, a specific 
rare disease community, uh, really coming together behind the Lymphedema Treatment Act. And this community worked, as you can see from the bottom line at the bottom of the screen, um, it started in the 11, 111th Congress, so 12 years ago. Uh, a mother met with her representative and talked about the coverage of um, compression garments and how they weren't covered um, for many lymphedema patients. Uh, she was the mom of a boy with primary lymphedema. And um, upon meeting with the mother, um, that representative set out to introduce a bill uh, for Medicare coverage of the uh, compression garments. And, um, and you can see how it started out small with uh, just a house bill and 58 co-sponsors. And then the next Congress, they had to start all over. I believe even that representative actually uh, didn't return to Congress the next time and they had to find a new sponsor for the bill and, and get co-sponsors again until finally they had both a House and Senate bill several years later. And then it took several years um, until it actually passed just this past year in 2022. Uh, it finally passed and they went to the implementation stage and, and now CMS covers these compression gar garments for uh, lymphedema patients. But it was a lo long and I'm sure tedious process for many of their advocates, but they were resilient and perseverant and they stuck with it. And I just think it's it's just a lovely illustration of a community coming together and uh, sticking with it um, for as long as it took. And I wanted to share with you some uh, advocacy opportunities in case you are interested in joining rare disease legislative advocates in the future. Uh, we are, um, all of our events are free and open to any rare disease patient, caregiver, family member, community member. We really don't uh, define. <laughs> um, so um, anyone who feels connected to the community is welcome to advocate alongside us. Uh, we have Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill coming up in just a few weeks here in Washington, D.C. It's a series of events throughout the week. Um, as you can see here, it is in person in Washington, D.C., um, but several of our events are going to be live streamed for people to join us virtually. The main event that will be for in person only during Rare Disease Week is those meetings with members of Congress will be for those who attend in person. Um, but if you are interested in joining us for Rare Disease Week this year, I know it's last minute, but our registration is open uh, through tonight um, officially. If uh, you are interested in attending, please feel free to email me. Um, we can certainly get you registered past this February 8th uh, deadline if you are interested in attending. Uh, we will have a virtual registration that opens on February 11th. So if you're interested in viewing any of those live streams of our events during Rare Disease Week, the legislative conference, the documentary, the DEIA discussions, and the uh, Rare Disease Congressional Caucus briefing, um, then you should definitely register um, starting on February 11th uh, for that virtual registration for Disease Week. And you can find more information and in the registrations um, at rareadvocates.org backslash RDW. And then for future years, just to put this in your um, awareness, we do offer travel reimbursements for a limited number of advocates to attend Rare Disease Week. That application usually opens in the fall of the year before Rare Disease Week. So if you're interested in attending in 2025, um, keep an eye out for the travel reimbursement application opening in the um, fall of 2024. And um, in addition to the live streams, we'll also have an action alert available 
for anyone who isn't able to participate in person so that you can call or email your members of Congress on the Hill Day um, and make sure that your voice is heard as well. And then Rare Across America is the program that I quickly mentioned earlier when I was talking about meeting with your members in the districts. Uh, Rare Across America uh, is scheduled for 2024 in August, from August 5th to 16th. We choose August because that's um, a month where the um, representatives and senators take the month of August usually to go home to their districts for the entire month. Um, so they're usually available and working out of their home offices. And so we have kind of turned Rare Across America into a hybrid program to allow for both virtual and in-person participation for those who um, aren't um, keep able to meet in person yet. Um, and so we, what we have done is split it where folks can uh, register to participate virtually with their senators. And we'll schedule those meetings virtually with the senators um, and or um, people can register to attend in-person meetings with their representative in the industry offices. So you can do both or one or the other, um, whatever um, you feel comfortable doing. And that registration will open on May 13th. Um, and you can find out more information about the program in general at rarecrossamerica.org. And then we have two fun, unique programs too for our young or rare disease advocates. We actually just um, started with the Youth and Teen Advocacy Day last year. It was our first one. And that is a virtual event for kids 10 to 18 years old. Uh, we'll do some virtual trainings ahead of time, and then we'll schedule virtual meetings for the kids with their representative and senators on June 18th. And then we have a really wonderful young adults program. So if you have any young adults, in your life um, who are interested in becoming more involved in rare disease advocacy. Uh, this program is open to anyone ages 16 to 30 years old. It's our Young Adults Rare Representative Program, and it's a group of highly motivated young people. And they're, the main purpose of YAR is to instill confidence in the next generation of rare disease advocates. Uh, and they provide skill building opportunities throughout the year. Um, for the young adults. And if you have any questions or you're interested in getting more involved or just um, want to see what else we're up to, feel free to check out our website, everylifefoundation.org. We have various social media accounts for both Every Life and Rare Disease Legislative Advocates on Facebook, X, Instagram, LinkedIn. And you can, of course, email me at sbonfelden at everylifefoundation.org. And um, I will conclude and hand it over to James. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being here and sharing this with us. James, go ahead and unmute. We'd love to hear about your experience uh, advocating with Every Life Foundation. Yes, thank you for having me. Before I get started, I just want to explain um, you know, my background and my story of how I started advoc my advocacy journey. So I was diagnosed with sickle cell at the age of two. Uh, you know, sickle cell is a rare genetic illness. It's an inherited blood disorder that affects the red blood cells. And when that happens, it causes shape, uh, your red blood cells to turn shape from round to sickle, and it blocks all blood th flow throughout the body, and it causes a painful episode. So Wherever the blood flow, I can have pain at in my knees, arms, and it's just the hallmark of the illness is pain, uh, better known as a sickle cell crisis. So being diagnosed with sickle cell, I always felt like, you know, I was all alone. My parents didn't know that they carried the trait or the gene for sickle cell before I was born. And there were no genetic testing or no genetic screening for sickle cell at the time. So they diagnosed me late. I was diagnosed at two years old, but lucky for my parents, I was diagnosed soon enough so that more complications didn't happen. Because like I said, blood flow can be blocked anywhere inside the body. 
So sickle cell can cause you to have a stroke, heart attack. It can cause you to have organ damage, blindness, and even death as worst case scenario. Um, my mother found out that I had sickle cell because I was playing with my other two siblings and she heard me let out a loud scream and went over to check on me. And when she checked on me, she noticed my hand was swollen and puffy, like the size of a tennis ball. And she wasn't aware that I hit my hand on the wall, but she didn't notice any bruising. So my parents took me to the emergency room. I got checked out. And that's how I was found out I was diagnosed with sickle cell and I had the inherited blood disorder because the blood test showed that my sickle my cells were abnormal. So that led me to you know, wanting to speak out about my illness because as a child, I was in and out of the hospital often. I had to deal with many needles, many uh, blood transfusions, many doctor visits, many ER visits. And I couldn't do the regular things that normal kids could do at my age. So running around for long periods of time would cause me to have a decrease of oxygen in the blood and that could cause my cells to sickle. Playing sports was out of the picture for me. Also, just, you know, just growing up and going swimming. Like the normal kid would go swimming and I couldn't do that. So it was hard on me. I always kept my illness hidden and I never wanted to speak out about my illness because I felt different. Like many people who live with rare diseases or grow up with rare diseases, you want to let your voice be heard and you don't want to feel like you're the only one going through something. So I wanted to share my story and advocate. My decision to advocate also came because I was faced with many stigmas as I became an adult receiving care in the emergency room. So me being an African-American and going into a system that was not there to help me or was, you know, not... I said not there to help me, but it was there to help me, but a system that was not treating me right because of my background, because of my illness, I had to deal with a lot of stigma. So my pain caused, my illness causes pain and I need to be treated with narcotic pain medication. Well, doctors would have me wait for long periods of time before checking in. And I would also be given inadequate amounts of pain medication or labeled a drug seeker coming in for care. As you can see, I don't look like I'm physically have an illness. Um, and that's a lot of rare diseases within the community. They don't look like they have something going on inside the body. And so having that as a burden is more of a burden to you because doctors are not ready to prescribe medication and you face a stigma because of it. And I was being stigmatized. So I wanted to change that part about it. I also wanted to let people know exactly what sickle cell was and bring awareness to the genetic illness. Um, it's considered a rare disease, even though it affects 100,000 people, but because it affects less than 300,000 people, uh, I wanted to make it aware in the African-American community and I wanted to make it aware nationally about what I was going through. So that was my decision to advocate. So I got into many different advocate, advocate avenues, uh, from speaking to legislators, to speaking to hospitals, to speaking to pharmaceutical companies. And eventually it led me to speak out in front of legislators at, at Rare Disease Week. I found out about Rare Disease Week through online advertisements uh, within the sickle cell community and then going to check on their website and noticing that it was an opportunity as an advocate to let your voice be heard and help change policy making. Well, I never wanted to go into policy making. I always thought I was stay away from it. I was hesitant to go into it because I didn't know about policy. And a lot of people think about that when it comes to advocating that they're unsure about policy, but being at Rare Disease Week helped me learn about policy. I was taught how to practice my pitch so that I could speak to legislators when I went in the room. I was taught how to bring up different acts uh, in one pager so that I can give the legislators information about my condition and, you know, bring up acts that I wanted to see them help within the community. I was also taught how to just advocate and share my story and just 
be present with legislators and build relationships because I thought me going in to speak to legislators that they wouldn't listen to my story. However, I was wrong. Legislators do want to hear from the people who have illness, and they are the ones who can make the change because they can implement funding for research, bills for research, uh, bills for funding, bills for uh, to change hospitals and, and access to care. So that's why I continue to advocate for Rare Disease Week, and I continue to come back because it's an important piece to me, and it's you can make You're the fine. change, huh? <laughs> Did it throw you off a little bit that I yeah the screen, the screen. So you you can have an impact and you can make a change just by being there and talking to your legislators. Your voice is important, so I continue to speak up. I continue to go back. My first experience being up there, I didn't feel like I was alone because it was a whole bunch of. Uh, advocates with me and we all had different illnesses and diseases that we were advocating for but it was a com community and we united as one so it was very important for me to go um, and I say this line uh, a healthy person has a thousand wishes but a sick person only has one and that's to see our health uh, improve and to be healthy so that's important for me to advocate and that's why I, I advocate and that's why I'm here today. Well, that's why we wanted to have you on um, because uh, I've gotten feedback from people that, you know, of course you get a diagnosis and you uh, grapple with the diagnosis, you learn to manage it, you know, but at some point, like you said, you want your voice heard, yes. but um, the feedback I've gotten is that, you know, they were hesitant or nervous or didn't feel like they would say the right things or do the right thing. And it really sounds as if you had a positive experience with them coaching you. Is that correct? Yes. My experience was positive. Um, they, they really, talk to you. They really have a day for you to learn about advocacy. It's called Legislative Day on at Rare Disease Week. And it really teaches you, it's a like an eight-hour class, but it really teaches you how to go in front of le legislators and not be nervous to share your story and be open about your story because they want to hear from you. They don't get to see you. They don't get to see this, uh, the person who they may be helping pass bills for and and a lot of them sit on different boards for healthcare, so they they are involved with healthcare and they want to see changes in healthcare. But they just need the people to come to them and share their story. And so that's uh, it was a positive experience for me, and I was able to be around others my first time. It's so many advocates who return because it takes time to build a relationship. It takes time for a build a past that I was able to ask others who have already been there. And so people are so willing to help you at that event because we know that the common goal is to see healthcare improve for not just me, but for everyone who's advocating. So I've heard several times today about building a relationship. And how do you do that if say you're meeting with um, someone who's on the other side of the political aisle from you? just um showing up at every i show up at every oh event. shannon wants to say yeah something. she's popped on <laughs> shannon if you want to take this go ahead <laughs> hold on I, i'm happy to uh to ch chime in on that um if if james would like me <laughs> go ahead go ahead shannon. yeah this um, is a conversation we're all here so yeah i mean i think well What's important is to know that, you know, rare disease policy issues aren't partisan, right? They're not political. Um, we're trying to get treatments developed for people. We're trying to get people diagnosed with their diseases. We're trying to get them access to the care. And sure, sometimes these things can be politicized, but in reality, they're not political issues. And you can meet with a member who might disagree on certain certain issues um, or have a different way of solving the problem because we can come at um, solving the problems in a million different ways in so, for some for some issues. Um, and so I think it's 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 making sure you're conveying what those issues are 
so that they, they can understand what you're trying to solve for. And, and even if you're coming to them, asking them to support like a specific bill, um, I think leaving, understanding that even if that's not an issue that that member can support at that time, for whatever reason, there might be opportunities to work together in the future. So you don't want to shut the door just because that one issue might not be something that they are supportive of, or they might not feel it's a good fit for them, depending on what committees they um, are sitting mm -hmm. on. Um, but you don't want to shut the door because there might be another issue down the road that they do want to work with you on or that they're, that they can be supportive of. So, I, I mean, that's part of building the relationships too, um, because we do have our own preconceived notions of how things work or how things should be. And um, I think when you build those relationships, they see you as a real person and you start to understand that they also are real people with real, um, and they are, um, they do take these jobs. I know it's hard to believe sometimes when you're watching the news uh, or C-SPAN, if you're a nerd like me who watches C-SPAN, um, but they do take these jobs wanting to help people um, and trying to improve their communities and to help their communities and trying, trying to make the world a better place in most cases. So um, I think when you're able to, to kind of see them for the real people that they are. Um, I think that um, that happens through building these relationships too, um, that um, you can also take a step back from, from some of that. Thank you so much and feel free to stay on with us. James, continue. I didn't want to cut you off if you had more things that you wanted to touch on about your experience advocating. No, I was just going to say, um, I was just following up on a question too. I was just going to say that I've noticed that I continue to show up and maybe they, they won't support it, but somebody else in there on their side will support it. So uh, just continue to show up and show up, show up to different events and being involved with legislation by showing up to rare disease week or rare disease day or um, state advocacy day, they get familiar with me and they get to see me. And so now they, they are seeing the story and, and it's making it, can make an impact. They may not be, they may not be always for it, but uh, it's still making an impact, and they're still hearing it. And later down the road, they may decide to change their mind and 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 go for the bill. So, how many years have you been um, advocating, James? So for Rare Disease Week, I've been advocating over eight, uh, three years. Three yep, years. Three years. Yeah. So I guess I got started in 2019 and then after that it shut down with because pandemic, but I got started in 2019 and I've been coming back ever since I have done it virtually and I've have done it um state. So state advocacy day and rare across America. So I continue to come back. And the one thing I got last time I went to speak to legislators that was a part of this organization that, that every life put on was being recognized by a legislative and and not knowing who they were, but they recognized me before I, before I even got in there. So um, they do remember stories and they and they do remember um, that you shared your story and and what your story. They may not recall everything was it's about, but they do want to want to help and get to know your story. Thank you. Are you ready for me to share your pictures? Yeah, you can share my pictures. Now my pictures has to do with other advocacy too, because I think it all falls in line. Um, but yeah, you can share my pictures. There you go. Yeah, Tell so this is, <laughs> yeah, so this was me. Um, like I said, it, it was, I was nervous the first time I went. This is last year's group photo, um, but it's, it's just the idea. This just gives you an idea of what happens when you go in there you speak to the staffer or the legislator and they welcome you into their office. And the le the staffers are very um, knowledgeable about, about the bills that they may support or may not support, but they're very knowledgeable about the bills and having being prepared and having your one pagers is very important 
because it lets the uh, legislator know exactly what you want from them and exactly what you're trying to get past. And so this is me with a group of advocates and you, you form relationships with people in your state and you get to build on those relationships too with the people from your state. And uh, Every Life provides training, so they have um, a set uh, number of one-pagers that you can choose, and you can um, make your own, and they can help you with that also. Yep. In the first year, I didn't even know what a one-pager was, but because they had it prepared, I think the first ask was for newborn screening. Now, sickle cell is already in fact in many states, or well, 50 states, but Newborn screening is still important to me because had my parents known, they could have been better prepared. So I always advocate, too, for newborn screening. And that was one of the acts my first year. So if you don't have an act, they supply you with one. This is after years of advocating and speaking to legislators. Um, they recognize sickle cell disease as September as Sickle Cell Awareness Day in Wisconsin. So that the last photo was with me and two other people who advocate for sickle cell. And we finally had got it uh, passed to recognize sickle cell as um, advocacy day. Congratulations. Thank you. This is me last year. Uh, this is, I'm on an advisory committee and we help plan for rare disease and we give input about uh, rare disease week and we give input about the things that go on and what every life does. And so this is with me with the group of people. And like I said, we all have different illnesses, different rare diseases, but we all fighting for the same cause. And we get to grow together and we get to know, learn from each other and we get to know each other just because we're connected in healthcare. So this was um, just a photo from last year. This is me um, at State Advocacy Day. I was asked to present and give a speech uh, last year. So this is the state of Wisconsin, and I'm presented with presented a presenter with um, her name is Madison. So I was a presenter with her. She's from the state as well, and we just had a a chance to share our stories, and it was a huge success to have State Advocacy Day in Wisconsin, and a big turnout for us because um, we got to speak to our legislators and members. This is me um, being invited to speak at a pharmaceutical company. And so they asked me to come out and speak to them and share my story. And the gentleman on the left, he has cystic fibrosis. So it was important for us to be there. And they wanted us to share our stories for researchers so they can come up with drug development. So it's important that you advocate for yourself and, and share your story because the more you share your story, the more people hear and people are out there who want to help and and they want to see the faces for the work they're doing. And so this is me sitting on a panel with a, a person who has a rare disease and cystic fibrosis. This is me having an opportunity to go into the school. This is at Harvard and I had an opportunity to share my story and these are future uh, medical students. So I'm able to let them know about what's going on and what stigmas I face in the medical community. And hopefully that they, they can make a change and be the ones to change the way patients are being treated for sickle, with sickle cell and just across the board. And so I was happy to be invited to go up to the universities. And that's, a, that's another place you can speak at is universities and schools. Um, no place is off limit when it comes to advocating for your rare disease. And finally, this is, I did write a book about my journey because I was so passionate about spreading awareness. I had a chance to be on media and a daytime talk show to share my story. And I say that I'm not just sharing my story for myself, but I'm helping others and just to have coverage on a uh, level like this was important for me because we can't change like the view of sickle cell. We can make sickle cell more known. And so I had that opportunity to uh, sit with these two ladies and share my story and share what sickle cell was so that people can become aware of it and people can get better treatment and they can come up with cures and funding for sickle cell.
And then this is the last one. This is just a quote as I wrote and thought of, because when it comes to advocacy, the size of your audience doesn't matter. No audience is too small to hear your story. Stories go a long way and are the driving force behind change. And I really believe that sharing your story, whether it's with advoc whether it's with legislators or it's in schools or it's with pharmaceutical companies, share or to your neighbor or someone, sharing your story helps and it's moving to people and it can make a huge impact. Our voices really matter and every voice matters. And so I think it's important if you live with the rare disease and you want change for your rare disease, that you speak up and you be the change that you wanna see and you advocate for yourself. Thank you so Thanks. much for sharing. We've had people in the comments thanking you for um, raising your voice and helping others share uh, their stories. Um, Shannon, did you wanna jump on? We've got um, a couple of questions in the chat. Sure, Let's of course. See. Um, add you on. Um, Shannon, we've got this one. What about advocacy outside of legislative, like for Veterans Administration? Do some of these same tips apply? They do. Um, yes. So, um, so many of the federal agencies have different ways for patients to engage with the, the agency. So for instance, NIH holds public meetings and workshops that um, patients can be a part of. Um, and then many of the agencies have um, advisory committees. So the Department of um, Veterans Affairs actually has a number of different, what I believe they do call advisory committees as well. Um, and those are usually um, have, um, a number of different stakeholders on the advisory committees, including uh, patients, for instance, like um, NIH has different advisory committees depending on the institutes and it has a certain number of patient representatives or uh, doctors. Um, and so the VA also has these that are broken up into different subject matters related to Veterans Affairs. So um, someone who's interested in advocating with the Department of Veterans Affairs might want to look into those advisory committees and see which um, what committees um, handle which issues and, um, and check and see what the application process is for joining one of those advisory committees. Because those are really, um, if you want to make um, an impact, um, having a seat at the table is, is certainly the best way to do it. Um, another similar question, they wanted to know if you had experience working with veteran groups with rare, rare diseases. So um, we, this is something we have just started tracking as an organization is tracking um, whether or not advocates who advocate with us or participate in our programs are veterans or have served in the military in some capacity. Um, so that is a new area that we are starting to track data wise to better understand how the veterans community is engaging with our organization. And we certainly would love to, um, to hear more from veterans communities and learn more about how we can um, serve and help and engage with um, those individuals and organizations, most definitely. Thank you. And also, James, do you see um, you received a message? Just wanted to point it to your attention. You should be able to see it in chat. Um, oh, you yeah, can just type it. Yeah, you can type okay. it. You don't have to say it out loud. But okay. um, okay. Shannon, for that. you, if you have an issue you want to raise with lawmakers, but not a policy proposal in mind, how would you go about connecting with them? Or is it better to only reach out if you have a specific policy ask? So I know, like our big right during rare disease week, we really emphasize like having that ask because we're trying to um, 
really optimize the time that we have during those meetings and be impactful as possible. But part of advocacy is also education and awareness. And we don't always have the answers, right, when we're faced with a problem. So, I mean, if you uh, have something specific in mind, you're welcome to reach out to myself and our team, and I can uh, share it with our policy team to see if maybe there is already an existing solution out there that might help with the problem that you're facing. Um, if it's a problem that we're not sure about or that there isn't any proposed legislation or any proposed um, solutions out there, I think that's definitely worth a conversation with the office to say, look, this is what I'm facing. There are other patients out there that are probably having the same problems um, and, and see uh, if, if it's something that they're able or willing to help with. Okay, one, let's see. Would your organization help veterans get in touch with these advisory committees? And if so, how is the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, um, I can definitely um, look into um, the advisory committees and if there, there are, um, if they outline any application processes or timelines online and certainly share that information with you. I can put my email address for everyone in the chat or... Um, Actually, um, I'll put it in for you, Rachel, and then you can yep. put it in. I will for put it else. in. So, yeah, and um, anyone should feel free to email me, and um, I'll try and get answers as as much as I possibly can. Um, also, uh, Shannon, I, I don't know if you saw in the chat, several people have advocated um, with your program and had positive experiences also. And, you know, they thank you for that. Um, I know myself personally, I have uh, been one of your advocates before and I benefited from all the training also because uh, it was new to me at the beginning as well. Um, before we close, uh, did you have any final words that you would like to share? Uh, just building off of what you said, Rachel, um, I, I appreciate everyone who has engaged with us. And if you're not able to attend Rare Disease Week, um, I think one of the things that I love most uh, is seeing how advocates learn from other advocates. So you kind of passing it along to others and passing that passion and um, and love for advocacy on to um, others in their community. And so if there's anything that we can do to help support uh, your advocacy journey, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself and our team and um, we would love to help in any way we can. Thanks, we had another question come in um, and we have time for it. So do you have resources for state level advocacy, especially if there isn't currently centralized rare disease advocacy happening? Yeah, um, so we do have a state advocacy program. So um, Kendley Jones is actually our state advocacy manager. And we do have resources on our website about state advocacy. And you can actually um, go to the website. It's stateadvocacy.org. Uh, it was a URL that wasn't taken, amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> it's very general, like it would have been. So stateadvocacy.org. Um, and there's actually a map and you can actually click on the map and you can see um, if there's like a rare disease state organization in your state, if there's a rare disease advisory council in your state. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, you, it has contacts for like your Department of Health and your Medicaid commissioner, but that's a great first step to just clicking um, on your state, seeing what's there, um, and um, and then we do have different state advocacy specific tools and resources on that website as well. Thank you so much. James, did you have some last words you would like to leave our future and present advocates with that are watching now and will watch later on YouTube? Yeah, I say just get involved. If you're interested in speaking to your legislators to and want to make a change or difference for your community, then get, as, get involved with Rare Disease Week because 
they do give you the tools to help you uh, learn about advocacy and advocating on that level because it is important that we speak to these le two legislators and they're the ones that can make help make a change for us. And thank you both for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you for you having us. Yeah. And um, thanks to everyone out in the audience for watching. That is all the time we have. Reminder that today is the last day to register to participate in person during Rare Disease Week. Virtual registration opens on February 11th. TMA leadership, including our board chair, Lori Boyer, and new executive director, Paula Eichenbrenner, are actively exploring TMA opportunities and advocacy. We are interested to know if you, as members of our TMA community, want to get more involved in legislative advocacy like what we have discussed today. TMA has very active and positive relationships with federal uh, and regulatory agencies and aligning the experience of individuals living with myositis like you to policy goals that TMA can advance as an organization is exciting to consider. Lots of potential. If you would like to share your thoughts on legislative advocacy with us, please email TMA at myositis.org. Thank you for watching today. Have a great evening. Thank you.